You're all very welcome this evening, CBD. Um, I'm joined by Tom, right after your product manager for solar PV and environment lead in terms of sustainability, and also Nigel Black, like our technical director. Um, I'll just give you a little a brief overview of the company. Some of you might be familiar with the Bowder company throughout Ireland over the last 20 years. Uh, the company is a fourth generation uh, family run business with the most recent changeover happening in the last three to four years, previously run by Paul and Gihard Bowder for 36 years. In terms of employees, so we're looking at 1,250 employees European wide, which in the region 900 million euro turnover. 40% um, of our turnover will be export led, and there are 16 su subsidiary co companies uh, across Europe. Uh, we have eight bitumen plants for sorry, eight plants for bitumen single ply membranes and also polyurethane insulation. Just some information in terms of company position within the European marketplace. So for every every fourth roof in Germany uh, would be a broader project. And in terms of the, the European position, we'll be the largest producer of bitumen membranes, polyurethane insulation in Germany, uh, third largest in, in Europe, and as I said already, 1250 employees. That'll kind of give you an idea of, of the scale of, of the business. Sales and distribution. It's primarily flat roofing based. Um, we also have an element of pitch roofing based on the continent, primarily in Germany. 40% uh, of the, the products we would uh, through turnover is through bitumen, 25% uh, insulation, and 15% the single ply um, single ply products. And again, it's 60% in the um, in the home market, and 40% would be exported to the rest of Europe. So in terms of the, the locations of plants, these would be the locations of plants throughout Germany. Um, and Broke is the most recent um, plant that's been commissioned. Subsidiary companies or daughter companies throughout Europe. So obviously we have the Irish and, and a UK base, based in the UK since 1979, over 200 employees. Um, focusing on specification sales of flat roofing systems um, for balconies, flat roofing, terraces, also so solar PV green roofing and blue roofing. Product range, <clears throat> we focus on the UK and the Irish marketplace is bitumen membranes, same ply membranes, cold applied liquid waterproof systems. The different range of insulations in terms of PIR, mineral wool, which has become more popular in the last number of years, in terms of non-combustibility, um, cellular glass, primarily in the UK, vacuum insulation panels, and the insulation products will also come in flatboard and tapered. Green roofing is a, in terms of extensive systems, intensive green roofs and biodiversity. And also the topic this evening is PV. And we also have a, a range of accessories for flat roofing systems. It's just in terms of the, the locations and distribution of products, our main <clears throat> depot is in Ipswich with bases in Runcorn, uh, Glasgow and Laird for distribution. Okay, thanks Martin. Okay. Store time there now. Thanks very much. Um, hi all. So um, my name is Tom Rafter. I'm the uh, Solar PV Product Manager for Bowder. Um, and as you're aware, I'm going to be talking to you today about solar. Um, the idea behind today is to give you an overview of applying solar to flat roofs. So I'm not going to spend too much time getting into things like photons and electrons. We're not going to get into the into the sort of detailed electrical side. It's more about as part of the design team, how you apply solar to, to flat roofs, what you need to consider, the drivers, why we, we're doing more solar on, on our rooftops. Um, and then we'll look into more detail at um, applying green roofs and solar um, together. And then finally, we'll finish up with a bit of a discussion around the sort of fire standards and where we're at at the moment with applying um, solar to flat roofs and green roofs. And I've left that bit very much to the end because I think that's where all the discussion will be and where, where the uh, questions will be. Um, so um, uh, when we're talking about solar, we're talking about, photo or, sorry, when we're talking about photovoltaic, we're talking about solar, PV, um, something called, um, it's electrical energy from sunlight. We're not today talking about solar thermal and heating systems. Um, the reason uh, solar PV has really taken a march as, as far as renewable technologies on our building is concerned really is because it's 
easy to design and install, which is why we are here as roofers and we can, you know, uh, we can deliver it. Um, it's, it's scalable. So whether you have one panel or five panels on a roof or 5,000 panels on a roof, the technology is not really very different. Um, it's easy to maintain, it's easy to install, it's easy to work out the return on investments. So for all of those reasons, solar PV has become a really important part of our building design um, and what we apply to our buildings, um, particularly as, as the decarbonisation agenda becomes much more important, as it should. Um, there's not a lot to a solar PV system. I mentioned a moment ago what, that it's become an important part of what we do because it's simple there's not a lot of parts so we have a solar panel your your collector if you like um you've all seen these before i'm sure on some kind of mounting system that attaches it to the roof we have dc cables coming in via an inverter so the inverter is the brains of the system it uh, switches the energy from DC to AC, so it can be used in our buildings, it manages the energy load, it does the fire management. So the, the inverter really is a, a, an important part of the system. And then we've got an AC cable or cables into a fuse board. Now it says their main fuse board, it might be the main fuse board, it might not be, it really does depend on the building type, um, the, where the distribution boards are. If you're working on commercial buildings, that may well be a connection at plant room level or rooftop. Um, it depends on the size of the system. If it's a particularly large system, then it may well be back to the main fuse board, but it can be flexible. And then we're back to the mains. So as I said, there's, there's not a great deal to it. Simple systems. Um, and what's driving them? Well, I'm not going to get on my soapbox too much tonight, um, but we have a climate crisis on our hands. We have to do something about it. We need to decarbonize our grid, electrical grid, um, and solar PV is a small but important part of that. It's not a silver bullet. It's not going to fix all our woes, but um, it's a really important way of helping to decarbonize our buildings, and it's a really good tool. Um, historically, uh, I would very much, you know, the, the driver behind solar has very much been that um, that decarbonization agenda. And we have things like NZEB um, coming into play now, where um, which will drive the specification on new builds. Um, and I guess, sorry, one of the things I should have said at the start of this seminar is I am, um, so I'm obviously UK based. Uh, we do a lot of work in Ireland. A lot of what I'm talking about today will, you know, will will um, span both the Irish markets and the UK markets. I, I'm, as I understand it, a lot of you will work on projects in in the UK as well. So, but NZ will drive specifications on new builds. What's changed over the last twelve months is the energy prices, and you know, we all know what's happened with energy prices throughout Europe and why it's happened. But if I was doing this this seminar to you 12 months ago, I would have been talking about the decarbonisation agenda and how you can save money by decarbonising, win-win. That conversation is very much flipped on its head now. And actually, most many of the projects that we're working on, there may be drivers for NZEB or BRIAM or, or local planning conditions, but largely from a client perspective, solar PV pays for itself. Um, we've got UK based clients that were paying nine pence per kilowatt hour in 2019, um, 22, 22 and a half pence per kilowatt hour for their electricity in uh, at the start of last year. And they're now paying or they're now being advised that they'll be paying upwards of 60 pence per kilowatt hour uh, when the when the price cap ends in April. So it's not an exaggeration to say that prices have gone through the roof and they're not likely to come down. If they do come down at all, they won't come down very far. And that has meant that solar PV systems are um, paying for themselves and paying for themselves very, very quickly. Um, solar PV system. If you install a solar PV system on your house or your, your office building, ultimately you pay for the system to go on the roof. And then the, the energy that provides, you get for free or you're not buying it from the grid and that's how you make your saving you can sell your electricity back to the grid um but the return on investment is really made you'll you you'll get significantly less what you sell back to the grid than what you're saving by uh, that you can use on site um self-consumption 
So um, we look for sites with, when we're designing solar PV systems and the best return on investment is always where you can use as much energy on site as possible. Now, if you're looking at schools, offices, libraries, factories, any buildings that have a relatively high base load and are occupied during the day, solar PV will make absolute sense from my financial perspective. It's slightly different for domestic um, because it does depend on, on um, when and how the the occupier uses their electricity it's much harder to predict and project how those occupiers are going to use the electricity um, but it still does make make sense i mean generally when we do our calculations we might at the moment be looking at three to five years for for a commercial application very often it is three years now uh, whereas you'd be looking at maybe seven years for a domestic um, because that self-consumption is is largely less but battery technology is coming down the line getting better and cheaper all the time the management systems so um diverters so that that electricity goes into your hot water tank or charges your electric vehicle are, are the, the technology is there now so the self-consumption is pushing up all the time but the, the as i said the, the best return on investment is where you can use the energy on site and a quick case study, this was a project we actually did um, three years ago now, I believe. Um, they are, as of last year, paying 34 pence per kilowatt hour for their electricity. That system would pay for itself within four years, um, saving in year £40,000. That would have cost about £130,000 at the time of installation. Um, and what we see here is the energy consumption of a... Um, this was a primary school in Suffolk in the UK that we installed many, many years ago now, but it gives you a really good idea of the kind of energy profile that a school will have. Um, so 7.30, 7 in the morning here, 7.30 at night, and your solar PV system will be producing when they're using their electricity. And for the return on investment side of things, that's really what we're looking for. So um, the drivers are there now, whether it be planning conditions, whether it be um, financial savings, we're going to be installing more solar PV on our roofs. And we really, really should be. Um, and But there are a number of design considerations we need to think about. We are biased, I will give you that. But the first thing that we look at when we're looking at a, uh, a putting a, a solar PV system on any roof is, is what is the roof? What are the roof exist existing or, or new roof conditions that we're putting it onto? If you're retrofitting solar to an existing roof, um, the best time to do it is when the building is being re-roofed. So if your building looks like this, oh, sorry, your roof looks like this and your client is saying to you, well, you know, we want to get, we've got a pot of money to spend on solar. Don't really want to spend anything on the roof, but let's get something up there. If it's not leaking now, it definitely will be by the time that you've in installed a couple of tons of ballasted solar. I am not by any stretch saying that you shouldn't retrofit solar to existing buildings. Um, but the, the key thing is to ensure that you're not going to, one, invalidate any roof warranties uh, or two, do any damage to that roof or cause any leaks. So making sure that the warranty provider is, is consulted uh, is really important. And there is often a decision, a balance to be made by should you overlay it and extend the roof warranty so that it matches the solar PV lifespan? Or if it's five years old and you've got a really good warranty in place, then, then you can just go back to it. But it's a conversation that should be had. Um, the second image there is, is about membrane durability, and it's largely relating to new build. And it's about value engineering. So very often, different roof membranes will have different um, friction coefficients. They will have different levels of durability. The protection and the mounting system that you put in will vary depending on the, on the waterproofing system. So I guess the key message there is, if you're putting a solar PV system on a building that's designed to last 35 years, but you put a roof system up that only has a 10 year warranty, is that value for money? Is that the right decision to be made? Um, equally, if you're value engineering or if a system is being value engineered, ensure that the solar PV provider knows what the, the new roof system is going to be. And the final one there for, from a roof perspective, structural stability. Um, 
most of the time systems on, on on flat roofs are ballasted you are adding a load to that roof so ensuring that there's a structural engineer involved and they've they've okayed it they've ensured that it's not going to have any negative impact on the structure is is absolutely paramount so we've established that the roof's okay to put our solar on there's a number of different ways that we can fix that solar to the roof um historically there were a lot of systems in the market that were installed uh, through mechanically anchoring. These days, not so much. We would only tend to install mechanically anchored systems as, as a market, as an industry, where either you're on something like a tower block um, on a pitched roof or on a coastal application where you've got really high wind loads. Um, if you do have to mechanically fix, then a bespoke fixing, um, this is a Nicholson IFP. Um, generally, they'd be provided with about a waterproofing membrane and that would be fixed down and then welded in. Um, Mechanically fixed systems are more expensive, they're more time consuming. So as an industry, they tend to be avoided. But if you've got any of the criteria I just mentioned, then you will have to. Um, we also try and avoid any any penetrations through flat roofs. So where you can avoid mechanically fixing, generally, that's going to uh, be beneficial. So most of the systems installed on flat roofs will be ballasted. Um, and there are lots of different options for ballasted systems. They are developing all the time and they're generally these days really very good um usually you'd be looking at about 25 to 30 kilos a square meter for a ballasted system the key things i would highlight if you're ballasting solar to an existing um flat roof or to or to a new build flat roof are that there must be a sacrificial layer between anywhere where you have the mounting system uh, connecting to the roof in this scenario here this is a really good cheap and cheerful solar pv mounting system but these metal plates will heat up to 80 degrees, potentially quite regularly during the summer. Um, so ensuring that there's a sacrificial layer wherever they're coming into contact with the roof is, is really important. Second item for, for ballasted systems, as they get more aerodynamic, as they get denser to get more on the roof, like this system here, really good low ballast system, but you're burying the roof. And ultimately, um, it comes back to that warranty element that I mentioned a moment ago. If you need to, if you're installing these systems, it's somebody in that process needs to ensure that the uh, warranty provider for the roof is, is consulted um, and that it's not going to have any negative impact on the roof. Once that system is in place, you can't do thermal surveys, you can't do a physical a visual survey of the roof finding any leaks can be really problematic and i'll come back to the warranty clauses at the end of the the webinar but um just ensuring that there's no negative impact on the on the roof warranty is really important um few quick design considerations regarding location and layouts of solar historically um uh the design tools, particularly for new build, things like IES would have the uh, a drop down box that would say, right, most efficient angle of panel, most efficient um, orientation of panel. And that's how it would design it as far as the thermal model is concerned. So you'd end up with um, your uh, thermal model saying that you've got 30 degree panels due south. Actually, on flat roofs, it's very rare that we install solar in that kind of orientation. At 10 to 15 degrees, you've got significantly lower wind loads. You're not you're not putting a sail on the roof effectively, so you don't need to mechanically fix. You need a lot less ballast. As importantly, you can get a lot more solar on the roof. So what you lose in efficiency, which might be one, two, maybe three percent max, um, you gain by getting a significantly larger amount of solar on your roof space. So you will almost never these days see solar PV systems installed at 30 degrees. Likewise, um, the, the thermal models will always push the system so it's orientated due south. If you've got a very large roof and we've got the luxury of doing that, then, then that's a, ex exactly what we will do. We will always try and orientate the panels as close to south as possible to provide the maximum generation and return on investment. But with most buildings, we don't have that luxury. And this is an, an example of a scheme we did in London. The planning conditions were that we had to just maximise the amount of solar on the roof. Um, it's part of the London plan. 
And so we did this design for the client. So the panels weren't uh, orientated due south, but they would probably get about 20% more solar panels on the roof than if we'd um, orientated them um, across the roof to face due south. Actually, what the client ended up um, going for was this system. Now, some of these panels are actually facing northeast, which is not what we would recommend. They still work in that scenario, but probably only at about 60% of the efficiency of the panels that are facing south um, southwest. So, um, but ultimately, this orientation would be what we would generally be looking at. So orientating the panels as close to south as possible. We do a lot of east-west systems these days where you concertina the panels across the roof, and that's so that you can get more panels on the roof. Um, but also it, we get a lower bell curve. So you get more generation in the morning, more generation in the evening, and, and on some projects, then you'll get more self-consumption. Wind load is really, really important. Um, the impact of wind load on a solar panel in the corner zone here will be about seven times that of the wind load in the field zone in the center of the roof. So as a general rule of thumb, we try and avoid the corner zones, edge zones of a roof. Um, as planning conditions and, and the financials that I mentioned earlier get more important, we are now gone are the days where we're installing four you know 10 solar panels on a 4000 square meter roof we are generally filling every square inch of roof space that we've got and that is putting pressure on on the designers to push panels into corners and edge zones as a rule of thumb you're going to have um some kind of safe access so you're going to have either an edge um restraint you know um um handrail or you're going to have a man safe fall arrest type system either way that will stop you going too close to the edge of the roof because that that will be in that zone but as a as a general rule of thumb please avoid putting uh, designing solar panels into those areas as a very minimum we would always assume a meter uh, around the edge of the roof um last point on designing solar into the roofs is shade so hopefully you're not too surprised to hear that so the solar doesn't work when the sun's not shining it also is significantly impacted by um shade so if you have a um or, or solar panels i should say are installed in what's called strings you have a string of panels usually around 18 that act as one power unit now i must say that the panel technology and inverter technology is getting better all the time so the impacts of partial shading are, are reducing all the time but again if you have the option avoid putting solar panels in shade so if you're doing a retrofit application martin or i will go out and do a survey for you we'll tell you where the shade is and we'll avoid putting solar panels there in new build it's much harder this is actually the m and &E, uh, at the headquarters of, of one of the uk's main m and &E consultants um, this was the roof plan we were given, and this is actually what was on site. So unless we're given that information, we can't design um, based on it. And in this scenario, this system will probably only work at about 60 to 70 percent of what it was originally projected to do. So we're avoiding shade wherever possible. So maintenance. Um, as with any flat roof, solar PV requires maintenance. Uh, we start with monitoring the system. So all of the inverters that we provide that are available in the market these days will have some form of built-in remote monitoring. And that can take a number of forms, um, but generally it's a web-based monitoring system. Uh, there's a system here um, called Solar Edge, uh, which is a really, really great solution. Um, and that has a power optimizer in the back uh, behind each panel. So each panel works individually. So it has, the, it has shade benefits as well. But the beauty of Solar Edge is that you can log in. You can see what each panel has is producing that day, week, month, year in its lifetime. It also gives you alerts. So if you have a problem with, say, in this case, this is a, a project that we did in the Midlands in the UK. This is the roof. This is a schematic of it on the online portal. We can see that inverter number two isn't producing what it's supposed to. And in this case, the um, uh, Solar Edge engineers could just log in, do a firmware update, and that inverter was working again without anybody going to site. But we identified that there were a couple of 
optimizers that weren't working correctly and they could send an engineer out to site to carry out maintenance and go specifically to those panels so maintenance is really quick and really straightforward and the system is is down for a very very short period of time so maintenance uh, sorry monitoring is is really important um we still then we can be proactive with our maintenance but we still need to maintain these systems and access for maintenance is is vital so there is so much going wrong in this image it's hard to know where to start but the first thing would be how are you getting, getting access on that roof to inspect your outlets how are you inspecting your solar pv system how are you inspecting your roof lights um so um again access around the perimeter really important safe access so if you need a man safe or a handrail that should be in place uh, you are going to have to access this roof and that maintenance takes a number of forms. Um, if you are um, next to the Hammersmith flyover in the middle of London at 10 degree panel face, then the chances are you'll have to maintain these panels and clean these panels every three, five years. If you're uh, in Galway near the coast at 30 degrees, the chances are that you'll never have to clean those panels. Or you may only have to clean them two or three times in their lifetime but it will depend on the outputs. And again, that's where the remote monitoring comes in because often you can be proactive. You can see if there's degradation and it's not producing what it's supposed to, and you can identify whether that's through, that's uh, because they need to be cleaned. We then require um, not so much maintenance, but an inspection of the roof side. So the mounting system or the connectors every three years, and then, um, maintenance of the actual uh, inverter and electrical items dc isolators should be on an annual basis i'll come back to that bit uh, a bit later on as well solar panels how are we doing for time so solar pv um panels uh Part of the reason I love working in solar is because the technologies are moving all the time. There's always something new to learn. Um, largely, the panels that we are installing are silicon crystalline panels. Um, so upwards of 95% of, of the European market will be, will be silicon crystalline panels. They are efficient. They're cheap. They're easy to get hold of. Um, they very very rarely go wrong so for those reasons this is this is the current uh lead technology and it just in amongst silicon crystalline cells we've seen um a move from a 270 watt panel back in 2018 now we're looking at 430 watt panels for more or less the same panel face so the the efficiency and the and the the, the technology is moving all the time and in amongst that, you've got lots of different options. So there's lots of different manufacturers. Um, the panels very much look the same, even, you know, even for somebody like myself who, who is involved with this day in, day out. If I go onto the roof and just look at the front of a solar panel, it's very, I, I would find it very hard to identify which manufacturers those panels had come from. We partner with two manufacturers, um, JA Solar are one of the world's leading um, suppliers of panels. They're a Chinese manufacturer. They're, they're very, very good quality um, and, and they're cost effective. They generally have a 12 year warranty. The alternative to that is something like this solar watt panel on the left. That's a glass glass panel with a 30 year warranty um, and slightly higher efficiency. Um, also has an A rating from a fire perspective. So, you know, it, it, Depends on what your client and what you're looking for, but ultimately, um, the, these two, th there are a number of options out there depending on the project. Inverter location is is uh, really important because if anything's going to go wrong with a solar PV system, it is generally the inverter. So inverters should be somewhere where they're easy to access, to maintain, and and um, and inspect. Um, you can put them on the roof. They are IP65 rated. So if you have very little space internally or if you just have a preference to put them on the roof, that's absolutely fine. Um, they should be out of direct sunlight because they will they will um, derate over a certain temperature. Um, they should also have a fire backing behind them if they're fixed to a wall or a, a fire, fireproof board underneath them. Um, 
I personally prefer to put them internally in a plant room where all the other M&E kit will be generally because um, out of sight is out of mind. And if they're in the plant room, it's far more likely that they will get inspected and they'll get maintained. And if they've got a red flashing light on the front, somebody will do something about it. Um, so uh, I guess shameless plug time, bow to do a couple of different systems. We'll come back to the green roof solution in a moment, um, but we have a really unique solution for flat roofs, um, bow to solar F, um, and it's a welded solution. So ultimately we only install on bow to roofs, but if you have a bituminous membrane or a single ply, we have a welded patch, which welds down to the roof. There's no penetration down through the waterproofing, but that patch is what holds the system to the roof. So it's the lightest system for crystalline panels in the marketplace. It's really quick to install um, and uh, it's universal from a panel perspective. Probably more importantly than any of that is the fact that we warranty the full system. So if you have a Bowder roof with a Bowder solar PV system, um, there are no clauses within our warranties or the clauses within our warranties are, are limited as far as um, inspections and um, requiring the solar to be removed from the roof. We will do that as part of our warranty cover, um, which is which is invaluable, really. I'm conscious of the time, so I'm going to skip over that video. Um, but um, we often these days get projects where we have um, clients who uh, have a flat roof. They want to install solar PV on top. And so rather than using a single ply membrane, and single plies are can be more vulnerable um, than, than bituminous membranes. So they look at a ballasted system with a bituminous membrane. And I would actually argue that one of our um, solar PV systems, whether that be Thermofol or Thermo, sorry, one of our single plies, whether that be Thermofol or Thermoplan with a barrel solar system over the top, actually provides a better warranty package than, than any other bitumen system with, with a ballasted solution. And it's also lightweight, it's cost effective, it looks good, um, it's flame free from an installation perspective. So there's lots of benefits there. Um, and a quick case study, this was the University of, or is the University of West of England. This is a robotics lab. It was an existing roof, um, a, a distribution center. And we stripped the roof back to the deck, um, went back with our PIR membrane, thermofold single ply and powder solar system. And it weighed less than the previous waterproofing and insulation. Um, so there was no issue structurally. So, um, Green roofs and solar. Now, uh, we will talk about um, the Irish requirements from, from a fire perspective in a moment, um, but I, many of you will work on projects in the UK. We have really strong policies now um, for both um, green roofs and site sourced renewables, and that is driving this combination approach. Um, historically, there's been this idea that, you know, uh, what are you going to have? Are you going to have solar or are you going to have a green roof? And actually, we now have the technologies. We have the tools to deliver both and layer the two. Um, I will caveat this with the fact that actually, if you have the luxury of installing a solar PV system in one area and a green roof in another, do that because um, actually it's going to be much cheaper. It's going to be easier to maintain. Um, these are generally new build applications, but largely and more and more, the drivers will push you to layer the two. So uh, in the UK, we have, um, well, in London, we have the urban greening factor. In the UK now, we've got biodiversity net gain coming in, uh, which basically means for urban sites, you need to install a biodiverse green roof. In Dublin now, you have the green and blue roof guide. Um, I'll let you guys read that, but ultimately you're looking at a 70% covering for, for roofs. Um, now it does state here, this is important for our conversation uh, in a moment, um, where roofs include PV panels, the design should consider the appropriateness of the PV panels being positioned over the vegetated areas of the roof. Um, that's, a, that's an important part of the conversation. But what it then go on to, goes on to say is that roof areas that are not considered for green roof due to the presence of solar panels should still be considered for blue roof. 
So we haven't covered blue roofs today. That's a that's a topic for another day. But ultimately, you're going to have a void layer that can attenuate water um, with a ballast finish, and then a, and then your solar panels put on top, as according to the to the blue roof guide. <laughs> So we call this combination biosolar roofs. Um, they actually work really, really well if they're uh, if they're done together um, correctly. So um, the vegetation has a cooling effect. It keeps the solar panels cooler. They work. There's lots of different studies coming out, but they, it usually is somewhere between four and six percent more efficiently. Um, and the PV panels help to break up the roof habitat. So you've got more drought areas, more water areas. So you've got more varied uh, biodiversity on that roof but they need to be done together correctly they need to be designed together and they need to be installed together and um i'm you know ultimately what we have at the moment um in both the uk and ireland is no real guidance on how to install solar pv certainly in the uk we have currently no guidance on flat roof mounting systems and there is no standard for flat roof mounting systems um, the MCS, the Micro Generation Certification Scheme, will be launching a new standard this year for installing on um, in, sort of for the installation of flat roofs, um, but um, there it does not cover for for green roofs. And if you just put a solar PV system straight on top of a green roof, this is the kind of thing that you can see. And and understandably, um, as we'll see in a moment, this is why the Dublin Fire Brigade would, would get nervous about them. But if they're done correctly, they work really, really well. So the FLL, the German Landscape Authority, who are usually ahead of the game, we usually catch them up about two years later, has released some guidance for combining biosolar systems. Um, and the main things would be a, um, a 200 to 300 millimeter gap between the bottom edge of the panel and the top of the growing medium. Um, and then a minimum 500 meter uh, vegetation barrier, which we have in as part of uh, grow guidance in the UK as well. Um, and then a minimum distance of one meter from the panels to any roof penetrations um, furniture. Um, so um, we hope the, that similar guidance will get adopted um, sooner rather than later in the UK. Um, certainly the GROW organisation is, um, the Green Roof organisation is pushing for, for this guidance to be adopted. And this is the system that we manufacture. So we have been installing biosolar systems now for uh, about five, six years now. Um, and this is the battle solar G light. So this is uh, a, a relatively um, uh, a new system to us. It's our sort of mark two, if you like. The key thing here is that we have a minimum 300 millimeter height from the bottom edge of the panel to the substrate. There's no, um, you will get condensation runoff of the solar panels year round. So it will irrigate this, uh, this area here in front of the panels. But a strimmer can can go right in the front of here and maintenance is really, really straightforward and easy. It's generally installed in an east west orientation. So the sun will arc across here and we'll get some direct sunlight to most of the roof. We have really specific planting mixes. So we have the Bowder Flora 3, which is drought tolerant, shade tolerant and low growing. So it works really well. And from a biodiversity net gain or urban greening factor perspective, our growing medium for our um, green roof acts as the ballast for the solar PV system. So the whole roof is green. There's no penetrations down through the waterproofing at all. Um, no, no fixings. Uh, and therefore, um, it, the whole roof can meet the criteria for, for both biodiversity net gain or the urban greening factor. Um, this substrate is non-combustible. Um, and we have a minimum requirement of 80 millimeters uh, for for fire eggs. So um, that is our G light system. Here is a quick case study. This was actually the first project that we installed in the UK um, by a solar system back in 2017. Feels like a very long time ago now. Um, the systems has ch have changed somewhat. We've learned quite a lot since then. But the main thing that's changed is our planting mix. So we do have a much lower uh, less rich planting mix that's installed now. 
Okay, so um, I will now jump onto the fire side of things. How are we doing for time? So, okay. So um, I guess for the next five minutes, I'm just going to run through um, the uh, the main considerations around fire and solar PV on flat roofs. Now, this is a a bit of a moving target. I would say it's a bit of a conversation. So we were really um, happy to come and talk to you guys today because actually, particularly within Ireland at the moment, that there is a, I would say, grey area around what the requirements are and what we need to provide for installing solar, not just on, on green roofs at all, but on flat roofs particularly. Um, and what are the impacts of installing solar on, on flat roofs? So um, I'm going to just run through a couple of minutes, a few quick slides, and then um, hopefully we can open up the sort of floor for a bit of conversation around this topic, because um, I guess I'm what I'm about to sort of go through will will probably just give you more questions than answers, but they are questions that that need to be uh, uh, had at the moment. So to start with, solar PV on buildings is is very low risk. Um, the BRE uh, National Solar Centre did a report. It's old now, 2018, where they analysed um, the incidence of recorded fires of solar PV um, on buildings in the UK, and they actually found that, um, well, firstly, it was very low risk. Uh, there were less incidences per installed unit of fires from solar peak caused by solar systems than there were by uh, tumble dryers. Um, the main risk areas were actually where there were fires that were caused. It was largely DC isolators not being maintained um, or poorly installed. And then following that, so 60 plus percent in total of the failures were due to either badly installed DC isolators or badly installed uh, connectors. And so that is a risk area, obviously. Um, on flat roofs, um, specifically, the there are it, it's more the passive impact of the solar on the roof that that causes the risk than um than, than the solar PV system in, it, in of itself. Now, we have a bit of an issue because under B-Roof T4, um, which is our, our sort of standard for, um, for fire in, on roofs, um, there, it's not possible currently to test a system with a solar PV panel on top. The, the methodology for testing two B-Roof T4 in flat roofs, we can't physically fit a solar panel on top of the, the roof system in the rigs that we need to test it. And so that's really limiting at the moment because we can't physically evidence that a what the impact of a solar PV system on the roof will be. Um, the, the main impact that we know is not necessarily an increase in the penetration. So uh, Barra have been involved in um, some work not building rigs work, but um, with with PU Europe and the Insulation Manufacturers Association, where we've evidenced that um, it's the spread of flame that's the impact. So does that solar PV system going on that roof increase the spread of flame? Well, yes, potentially. Um, and so that's the area that we're that we're really looking at. And that's the area of risk. So from a Bowder perspective, I would say that currently the, the best advice generally that we can give is that a roof should have B-roof T4 if you're installing a solar PV system on it. And then it's the design side. So ensuring that you're not locating solar panels close to any roof furniture, upstands, roof lights, penetrations, um, where uh, actually the, the roof could, uh, where that spread of flame could then get into the building. Um, within Ireland at the moment, we very much have uh, a criteria where most of the time we are being asked to design a system to meet the um, Dublin Fire Brigade requirements. Um, and so uh, I'm not going to expect you to all to read this. You're probably all, all aware of this, this guidance. I, I'm sure you are. Um, but I'm just going to highlight the individual points and just run through them um, one by one. So RC62 guidance to start with. 
um, the ask, uh, hopefully I'm not going to get shot down too much or it's not too contentious. The, the previous or the current iteration of the RC62 guidance has, and I'm not necessarily from a, from a fire perspective, but from a, um, a general solar installation perspective on roofs is problematic. And generally we don't see it referred to very often these days. There is a new RC62, which we um, have been uh, working on, which will be, uh, if we can agree, the wording um, will be uh, released this year. Um, we sent our comments back on it last week. So it's been a long time coming, but that, that should come through soon. Uh, but most of the stuff within the RC62 we can work to. We've then got NFPA and the MCS guide. All of that stuff is pretty straightforward and every single system that we would design and most most uh, contractors would design will certainly be to the MCS guidance um, and uh, and ECA. We then get to the point where actually this is the, the area where we get a little bit unstuck because this phrase here, um, the roof covering or decking under the array shall be of non-combustible materials and, in, and shall include a 500 mil fire break between the arrays and any green roof if provided. And actually it's this first part of the sentence that makes um, it difficult for us because the interpretation here is is difficult. How do we interpret whether the roof covering or decking under the arrays should be of, of non-combustible materials. Does that mean that if we've got a concrete deck in place, which is non-combustible, then you don't need to put anything else, you know, above, uh, uh, between the solar PV system and the waterproofing? I would argue, yes, that is the case, but very often I'm about to show you a case study where that hasn't, this, this course has not been interpreted um, like that. Um, the so so the the phrasing there does make it difficult for us, and um, I'm sure we'll we'll come back to this in a moment. But um, we really, as an industry, we need to look at this and we need to work out exactly what we're trying to achieve and and what this means, how this should be interpreted, because at the moment we we as as a a, a designer get sent either this phrase or variations on it on almost every project in Ireland that we're working on. And it makes it difficult for us because we it, it's, it's not black and white there. We don't really know exactly what we should be designing to. Um, and then we're, uh, the, 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 the second part of that is the fire break between the arrays and the green roof, uh, if provided. That's fine. Are we, I mean, ultimately, if the, the guidance is that we shouldn't be installing solar PV systems with green roofs, um, uh, then then that's how we design them. There isn't uh, necessarily a problem there. However, the guidance, as we saw before, um, with, um, you know, we, we are trying to move to a, 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 we have a climate crisis, we have a biodiversity crisis. We should be looking to try and um, move to, to the best environmental solutions that we can. And I would like to make, a, I feel like I could make a very good argument that doing a green, a biosolar roof well is the most environmentally friendly solution you can provide on a on a on any kind of building uh roof so uh, hopefully we can have a conversation about that that topic now as we open up for for questions the last two points on there absolutely standard so warning signage for firefighters no problem at all um and and solar cable suitable for for outdoor applications no problem at all as well so um yeah i'm quick case study this is uh, Edmund Rice College in, in Dublin. And um, what we've got here is a concrete deck. So the, the deck underneath that system um, is a concrete deck with a BTRS, uh, so our Bowder Total Bituminous System, PIR insulation, ballast requirement underneath the solar array. And then we've got our um, gap between our PV area um, and our green roof system. Now, this is actually our seed and blanket system. So that has B roof T4, including the, the vegetation. Um, and this is the kind of, of uh, project we're looking at now and, and how this, this guidance is being interpreted. A couple of final points just before we get on to the questions. Warranties for solar, it, 
it's really important that we look at all the different warranties. There are, as I've shown, there's a number of different parts of a solar system. You have your mounting unit, you have your inverter, you have your panels. Very often, clients come to us looking specifically at the panel side. Um, and that's the bit that always gets talked about. But actually, um, the inverter warranty is as important as the solar panels and the mounting system. The two areas of risk are panels coming off the roof and a, and a fire and your inverter and your mounting system are going to um, be your main uh, areas of protection against that. And then finally, just design service. Um, from a battle perspective, we will do a, a full design for, for you, for your clients, for the rest of your design teams. Um, and we will give wind load calcs, we'll give a roof layout that shows how the system looks on the roof. Really easy to do. All we need from you or your design team is a target output, a CAD for new build, target output, CAD roof plan with a north point building section and an address and we can do the rest um, in refurbishment it's much more nuanced we're looking at balancing it against the energy consumption looking at return on investment we will generally carry out a roof survey and we'll do all of that um, at the at the front end um, so I have uh, managed to make that last 50 minutes um, I hope that was of interest um, Paul I don't know if you want to open up the the floor to questions yeah, thank you, Tom. Very, very interesting. Appreciate your time and effort to present to us all. There's been a host of queries that have come in from, from the, uh, the viewers, which I'll rattle through a few of them. Um, the first one is for, is for Martin. Um, do you know offhand if there's an op opportunity to sell the power back to the grid yet here in Ireland? Uh, there is, Paul, yeah. It just depends on, on, on the, whether it's domestic or non-domestic. Um, it also can depend on the size of the array, but it's something that's only kind of started last year. And will that, hopefully that will um, then reduce the um, the payback period. I definitely will. Yeah, like the, there's there's varying rates of feed in tariffs. It depends on who who's your actual energy supplier. But as Tom was saying, like it's if possible, you match the array to the requirements of the building. Yeah, we clearly have somebody with an insurance hat in, in the audience, but he's posted a couple of questions, and I know who he is, but I won't. I won't. I won't publicize his name. Um, <laughs> do you ever consult with the building's insurers before you, you proceed with the install? Um, it generally, we we as Bowder wouldn't because, but we would advise that our clients do. So um, it's not generally going to be Bowder that would be communicating with that um, that insurer. Um, but absolutely, you know, the, we would always advise that our clients talk to their insurer before they install anything because, you know, they don't want to end up with a, a problematic uh, conversation with their insurer the next time, um, you know, they're renewing. Yeah. And as a follow on, do any, any of your devices have any um, insurer approvals like UL or VDS? Um, from a solar perspective, no, because we don't work in America. Um, the uh, sort of I, I'm not an expert by any stretch on the UL guidance, but from a from a roofing perspective, we have FM approval. I don't know whether you want to jump in there, mm -hmm. Nigel. Yeah, I want, just on the whole thing about insurance is the fact that um, one of the bits that Tom and I do a lot is consult with the insurance industry. So we speak to the underwriters, and so we have a good idea of what their thoughts are on fire we do follow their guidance in terms of how far or how close pv panels should be to penetrations and the like that's one of the things they're very keen on also that there should be uh, breaks in in the array so again we follow that i saw that was a question in in the mix there um, also, the fact that we know that the insurers are far, well, basically, certainly two key insurers have told us that if it's on a concrete deck, then they're far, far, far more relaxed. If it's a timber deck, it's a totally different uh, ball game. So that sort of follows with that guidance. Well, if it's a concrete deck, well, then it's, it's, it is or and not and in terms of the, uh, the other requirements. Um, I'm on the Factory Mutual Advisory uh, Council for... Um, um, Europe and in there they do uh, give guidance on PV and again a lot of that is to do with uh, design and layout which we do follow where we can um, there's no denying there's pressure 
to try and maximize, as Tom said, every inch of the roof, but we try to push back and say, well, you should have these margins. And that's an, an important uh, consideration for fire. I was looking at your install uh, map of British Isles there earlier, and obviously there's loads of um, your pins around the southeast of, of the UK, of England, um, far fewer up around Scotland and the west of Ireland. In terms of difficulty of, of install with the higher winds um, in those areas, are there any particular or more onerous requirements you have to allow for? Um, well, we will have higher winds. Um, so we have a different annex for, for Ireland to, to England and, and Scotland, um, but we will design the system accordingly, depending on the wind load zone, depending on the terrain category, depending on the height of the building. So it's quite a complex calculation that we do for every single project, depending on where the, where the site is. Um, I, I should say that that map of um, dots is not actually our installations. If we had a map of our installations, there would be thousands of them on there. The, the map of dots is actually local authorities that have announced a climate crisis, which I meant to mention at the beginning, but didn't quite get around to it. So, yeah. Yes, there are either fewer local authorities in Scotland or they're less worried. <laughs> yes, yeah. Glo global warming, you know, they might be looking forward to it. How does the efficiency of your panels deteriorate over time? Um, I talked about maybe a, a five-year cleaning period in some part of um, Western Ireland, for example. And anything further to add to that? So the silicon in solar panels degrades over time. So we, when we do things like we, um, well, you have a warranty to start with as part of the of the panel um, offer, and that usually guarantees um, eighty percent. Um, output at 25 years so that, that it won't degrade more than than 20 percent um over that 25 year period when we do return on investment calculations for example we always include a, a um 0.5 percent uh, degradation year on year just as a sort of really conservative factor um when you start to look at glass glass panels like the solar watt panels that i showed earlier they have an even lower degradation factor because they're they're you know in, really hermetically sealed then so um but they, they will degrade naturally because of the silicon in them and on the environmental topic um is there as yet any recycling offered for the panel panels or is there any we know for example turbine turbine blades it's, it's a very contentious issue so we uh, all the panels we supply the manufacturers are a member of a an organization called um oh god what is it called it's just gone out of my head there is a there is a uh, an international organization that all the manufacturers pay in every panel they supply they pay into this um pv cycle it's called and uh so panels can then get delivered to de depots throughout the uk and they'll they'll be recycled at no cost at the moment, there's very few panels being recycled, so um, it, it they're not there yet. But slowly but surely, I, I, we were in Germany this week, and uh, our French colleagues were telling me that just there's a there's a big panel recycling plant just opened in in the south of France. So it's it's moving that way. Is, um, that, because, is that because the technology and the PV panels is a relatively new technology? I haven't yet. Um, I've, outlived their usefulness or absolutely there simply is no recycling available no it's it's largely because they're most uh 20 2009 to 2011 we had we saw this solar boom so prior to that there were very very few solar panels installed panels should last 25 years plus so it's another 10 years before we're going to really start to see that level of recycling requirement ramping up in terms of the inverter location in the kind of a domestic uh, scenario have you any recommendations or preferences in terms of where the inverter should be you mentioned in the commercial it should be ideally in the plant room but in the domestic i might know as be a, a no. available, of an available option so the only the only advice i would give for domestic applications is that they are most inverters not all by any stretch are fan cooled they do they do pump out some heat and so they should be in a ventilated space um they can go you know in cupboards under the stairs and and that kind of thing but they will they will need ventilation so we see them installed quite often in lofts spaces they can be installed in loft spaces i 
wouldn't install one in my loft uh, but you know they, they absolutely can as long as it is is ventilated and and easily accessible for maintenance and i'll see also for the, for the, the fire and rescue services as well yeah exactly yeah out of interest what uh, inverter brand do you actually use we use um solis and solar edge primarily and then fronius is a third manufacturer um, depends on the application. Um, if there's shading or specific fire requirements, we tend to use Solar Edge. Um, if it's just a standard commercial install with no shading, um, then we would generally use a Solis inverter. Another question from our, from our insurance um, viewer. What's the worst case consequences of a uh, system being hacked? Hacked as in, well... Um, well, you showed, showed, you showed the... Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, and we have a lot of clients who spent, uh, so this is a, a, a sort of a about turn of answering the question, but we get a lot of clients who are very worried about the, not so much about the, the, the solar PV system itself being hacked, but the uh, web portal, because it's open, we, we need a, um, uh, access to the web. Um, and often the firewalls can cause problems with that, actually causing a problem hacking into the building via that portal for the for the solar system. Um, in all honesty, I don't know what whether it would physically be possible to to over you know um, to do anything with the with the inverter to cause any problems if it was hacked. But I can. I, it's not a question I've ever been asked before, so I can go away and find out, and I'll if I can let you know, Paul, and you can pass it on to uh, to the person asking the question. It's a good question. You no, know, we're also we're now living in the Internet of Things. I've got a number of devices downstairs which we've would, would never had three or four years ago, mm. and they're all connected to Wi-Fi. And I should have to think who could be up to, up to in nefarious activities. <laughs> um, there's a slight contradiction between what, you, between what you said earlier in terms of balancing the roof, or sorry. Fixing the uh, PV system physically to the, the roof and the requirements of the RC62, which recommends that you do fix it, whereas you're saying there are options not to fix it. How do you have a square, square a circle? Well, I mean, that's one of the points in the RC62 that in general the solar industry doesn't agree with. Um, so uh, RC62, the new version of RC62 does largely have that clause uh emitted i mean ballasting of solar arrays if you mechanically fix a solar array there's nothing wrong with with mechanically fixing a solar array uh, as long as the waterproofing is is not affected and actually if you look at it as an industry if if you have um a, a thousand solar panel system on a mechanically fixed um mount you've got a thousand penetrations through that waterproofing and so generally the, the advice for what are your risk areas? Well, okay. If that, if those panels blew off the roof, that that's a risk. But if you have a leak as a result of your solar array, because you put a thousand penetrations to the roof, that's potentially more, you know, or, you know, it's a different risk, but how do you weigh that up? Um, ballasted systems now are, are very, very good. And so actually, um, yeah, it, it's a it's a much lower risk than potentially it was five seven years ago when that document was written. Um, in terms of the cable connections, are you aware of any um, industry requirements in terms of uh, the standards which, which would apply? Do you mean the the connectors for the solar? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean the the main thing with connectors is that um, the same manufacturer, so the same connector. So we we use MC four connectors generally as a, as an industry. Um, and we would always advise that the same manufacturer of the MC4 is used. So it's, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, you, you don't have different manufacturer connectors connecting together. There's a very cheeky question here, which I don't expect you to, you to answer, but I'll ask anyway, out of pure um, divilment. <laughs> there are a lot of solar panel suppliers in the market. Are there any, any advice as to where to start? Yes, Bowder are very good. Um, I heard. Um, I mean, I, I would... Honestly, the advice I would give is that um, having somebody who's going to design the system up for you and, and supply it so you have no grey areas is the most important the most important thing. Whether that be your roof, whether it be your PV system, 
joined up thinking is is really important and um and, and joined up warranties is, is is really beneficial as well um so that that would be my pe- main main piece of advice i think tom with what we do find is the fact that um often the concerns about waterproofing are to- totally disregarded by somebody uh, that's just involved in PV and the concerns of PV are perhaps disregarded by the roofing. So it's trying, the reason Tom's saying what he's saying is that you actually need to bring them together. Otherwise you get compromise or out and out problems. Hmm. What's your experience of having to provide a, a farm, farming switch or a dead man switch? Is that something you get involved in downside of the inverter? Um, we don't, tend to get involved in that part of the design um we are not electrical um you know we're, we're roofers ultimately but most of our i mean certainly in ireland now i think the guidance is that you have a a um a fireman switch um part where you need a fireman switch we will generally specify solar edge because they have a very nice slick solution for that um but there are lots of options on the marketplace now for them okay um, have you any recommend? Rec- sorry, do you ever recommend AFTD on electrical cabling? No, I mean we we don't get involved in that part of the design, so um, uh, we wouldn't. Yeah, we wouldn't get recommend it either way. Um, the question is still coming in fast and take, but I'm just conscious of the time. It's nearly ten mm-hmm. past eight. I propose just ask one or, one or two more. Um, sure. And what we'll do is we'll get a printout of the re- remaining questions pass them over to you and if you have find a find a time amongst your busy schedule maybe perhaps you can come back to us and we'll try and disseminate of course. The answers um have you ever, ever been asked about the glare to aircraft near uh, airports yes many times um and solar panels if they had a lot of glare they wouldn't be working very well because you, you're trying to absorb as much of that light as possible so if most of the panels that well all of the panels that we supply will have an anti-glare coating but also if you look very closely at the at the face of a solar panel it's it's almost like um uh pocked you know it's like it's um it's it's not a flat uh, flat sheet mm. and so we've got loads of documentation around anti-glare and and the fact that it's it's not really an issue and earlier this will be the final question um you Showed us the three typical conditions which Dublin Fire Brigade append to their fire threat applications here. Is there any com- comparable um, example from the UK? Building control not, there? not really, no. I mean, London London Fire Brigade um, do do have some guidance, but it it's very different to to the Irish uh, to the Dublin Fire Brigade. Um, generally. Uh, well, no, the, the answer is generally no. I mean, different local authorities might have different planning conditions, but ultimately, um, <laughs> ultimately, the answer is no. Mm. I, I, I find Mr. Rexner, I actually will ask one more question. Sure. Um, does the green roof improve the terminal performance of the roof? No, no. Um, well it it will have benefits so it will provide thermal shading so it's it's good from a cooling perspective ultimately the green roof is a wet system you know it'll be saturated at times when it's cold and wet outside the the green roof in of itself will be be cold and wet so it wouldn't actually give you any true thermal value very good gentlemen thank you for your time i do appreciate it um certainly we had a large number of viewers come in this evening over 250 so thank you, thank you again. Appreciate it. And we'll say good night. Thank you, Paul. If I could say one thing um, just at the end, we would love to engage with anybody who's interested in that conversation around the wording of the, the Dublin Fire Brigade and the and the the top the the deck or covering. And so um it's a we've got you know we, we would love to to have more of a conversation around that so if there is anybody on the call who is in a position to have those conversations then please do get in touch we'll do indeed thank, thank you very, all for your time appreciate and thank, thank you for organizing well, paul nigel our pleasure thank indeed thank, thank you very much all.